Open BIM is here. So I think you made the good choice to come here and learn about it today. Uh, so I hope I can give you some new knowledge. My name is Tomás Erős. I'm a BIM consultant from uh, Rafis of Hungary. In the next roughly 35, 40 minutes, I will talk about Open BIM as a concept, uh, as a methodology, uh, what it is, and then maybe give you some steps or practical uh, tasks or, or homework, what to do to be able to work in this collaborative environment. Uh, then, just a little briefly, I will mention BIM standards again, uh, but Stefan, in the previous presentation, already talked quite a lot about their standard in the UK. So, Open BIM is the universal approach to the collaborative design, realization, and management of buildings based on open standards and workflows. Open BIM was initiated by software developers who wanted to build bridges uh, between their software to the benefit of the users. But recently, uh, BIM professionals, AEC professionals from all around the world picked up this uh, methodology and kind of project execution uh, workflow and mindset. And also BIM standards are based on uh, Open BIM nowadays. Open BIM provides a transparent workflow for all the stakeholders in the project. Uh, starting from the designers, engineers, the contractors, and of course, most importantly, the client, because in the end, his money is at stake. Uh, it provides a smooth communication between the stakeholders. Everyone knows at every stage what's happening, what's going on, uh, how the design will look. Uh, and the data collected through the design, uh, through the construction, can be used in the whole, throughout the whole life cycle of the, of the building asset. Uh, it provides a system independent, software independent uh, workflow or methodology. You can pick the best software, the software you are most familiar with, even smaller software vendors just by looking at the, the sponsors at the beginning of the conference. Uh, I already counted four or five uh, new softwares to me that can work with OpenBIM data. And that I think that's great because you have a freedom of choice uh, to pick the best software for you, uh, for your company and for your workflow. And excuse me, I'm going to show this slide uh, again, and it looks like this is the hot image of uh, today's conference. Uh, but I think it's a very great slide because the clever guys in the UK phrased the, the benefit of Open BIM from the client's perspective uh, really well. It means that thanks to these uh, technologies, uh, we can build cheaper, we can build quicker, uh, greener, uh, considering the environment. And let's not forget about the last, the fourth point, uh, improvement in exports, which me basically means that all the knowledge that we learn uh, from these projects uh, can be benefited. Uh, so you, if you are uh, learning these methodology and learning to use Open BIM, uh, then that gives you some new business opportunities maybe in the future. So uh, that's why it's really good that you are here. And I brought you an example uh, again, from the client's perspe perspective, uh, how they look at OpenBIM and what they can get from OpenBIM. This is a hospital project from Sweden, uh, designed by Link Architecture. Uh, it's a renovation and refurbishment of uh, the Stockholm South City Hospital. It's a really huge project. And the client, the property manager of uh, Stockholm Country Council, uh, they wanted to keep a close eye on the project execution because they wanted to certify the building according to a Swedish green uh, certification. Why did they want to do that? Because they wanted to provide the best building for all those healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, and of course the patients uh, that have to visit, uh, work, and uh, heal in this building. So they wanted to provide the best environment for the people uh, who will use this building. To do that, they needed this uh, certificate, and to get the certificate, they needed certain simulations, energy, daylight, accessibility, and other simulations as well. They wanted to, uh, to get the cost and the time schedule under their control, under the client's control. Uh, that's why they also needed BIM technologies. Uh, and to provide the best building uh, for its users, the architect had to consult a lot with healthcare specialists. And they also uh, wanted to do that in this uh, BIM environment. They wanted to utilize BIM technologies. I will show you how. Uh, during these coordinations. Of course, clash control comes natural when uh, 
high quality uh, should be achieved. And from the collected data uh, during the, the design and construction, they wanted to utilize the data for facility management and they wanted the models and the data through IFC handed over for facility management. So the architect, uh, to be able to comply with these high standard requirements from the client, had to use a lot of different solutions, uh, different modeling applications for uh, its architectural uh, design. Uh, the structure engineer, the MEP engineer, had to use other softwares to build their models. And then, of course, these were combined and used uh, for many purposes. And OpenBIM made this possible. So OpenBIM uh, can evolve a lot of uh, software and can combine them in one uh, environment to provide the best solution for the client. I mentioned these consultant coordinations. Hospitals are very complex building with lots of different uh, furniture, special equipment, uh, special MEP underneath the, the surfaces. So the architect has to talk a lot with, uh, with nurses, doctors, other healthcare specialists to, to learn what they need in certain uh, types of rooms uh, in different parts of the building. Of course, they use traditional 2D drawings, but these, uh, these guys, these specialists, might not be familiar reading and understanding 2D drawings. So they, they introduce 3D, uh, not just drawings, but 3D models uh, with BIMAX uh, to these specialists, to the nurses, to the doctors, and they really enjoyed exploring that uh, future work environment so that they could provide their input and uh, influence the design and the arrangement of the furnitures. And this meant a lot of uh, a collection of a uh, lot of data during these uh, coordination meetings. This data, uh, to be able to collect it and be able to utilize, was put into a system called BIMI. Uh, that's a web-based uh, database, basically. And this BIMI database can connect to the BIM model as well. It uh, could synchronize with the designer's tool, with Archicad, there were uh, defined IFC properties to do this kind of uh, two-dimensional, uh, two-directional data transfer between the BIM modeling tool and this information database. And then uh, schedules, lists were then generated from this database as well. I mentioned that quality is uh, very important in this kind of uh, projects where the client has uh, high requirements. And in this case, Solubility was used to bring all the models together, the architectural, structural, and MEP model, and then do uh, quality control in Solibri. And as you can see in this image, uh, hospitals are very complex buildings in terms of not just architecture, but MEP and the furnishing inside. So as a result, uh, all the stakeholders, the different designers and engineers, could work together in this open beam environment. Uh, this quote comes from a different project from Down Under, from Australia, but I think it also grasps the essence of, uh, of OpenBIM. That OpenBIM, uh, thanks to OpenBIM, different software platforms can now talk to each other. And thanks to these software platforms, uh, of course, there are people behind the software. So thanks to OpenBIM, people can communicate better and talk to each other uh, better than the traditional methods. But what is this open BIM method and how to work in this environment? Of course, the, uh, it starts with, with models that all the uh, stakeholders involved in the design, the architect and the engineers, have to build their uh, own models. So there will be an architectural model, a structural model, and the MEP model. Uh, and during the, the design process, these models will be uh, coordinated and combined. Uh, how to combine these? Uh, I started with architecture because usually building design starts uh, with the architect sketching up a conceptual design. Then comes the structure engineer uh, trying to realize the design and make it stable and not collapse. Uh, and they exchange data. There's a selective uh, data and model exchange because uh, the structure engineer doesn't need everything that the architect puts into the model. It doesn't need the uh, the finished details, the, uh, the furnishing, sometimes just a selected uh, set of information. So the architecture model is filtered and sent uh, to the structure engineer who uses it as a reference to create uh, his own structural and analytical model. And in the end, uh, the structure engineer can provide the structural model back to the architect uh, also as a reference uh, because, of course, architect doesn't or might not understand the analytical model of the structure engineer. 
So they only need the geometry, uh, the volume of the structural elements. And of course, uh, the MEP engineer, the building systems engineer, also joins the project uh, with a similar workflow, selective uh, model and data exchange, and the reference model concept. And they exchange uh, models, the architect and the MEP engineer. And then, uh, when we have the models from all the three disciplines, this can be combined, uh, in, for example, in Solibri, uh, to do checking, clash detection, and, uh, and to do uh, quality control of these models. And of course, as the design process moves forward, the contractor will come on board, and they need uh, the they can utilize these models as well. They can do quantity takeoffs, for example, in Vico office, attach uh, time and and cost to those to do uh, the schedule or plan the schedule of the construction, plan the the cost of the construction. Now, just to uh, wake you up a little bit, I will switch to Bmax and hopefully show you a kind of multidisciplinary model uh, on my iPad. Can you guys switch the screen to BMX? Uh, okay, I should reconnect. Should be okay now. Yeah, so this is BMX uh, on my iPad uh, Pro. And its main advantage is that it's mobile. I can take it anywhere, uh, even on the construction site. So it's fairly easy to, uh, to have the models with me on the construction site or at a coordination meeting. So I have the whole building. I can navigate in it. And I can not only uh, just visually explore the building, but I get all the information from the different parts. That this is a curtain wall, uh, its sizes, and uh, even if the manufacturer is uh, already decided, then I can get a link to the manufacturer's website and get all the product-related information uh, to this element. But it's not just a pretty architectural model. I have here, for example, the structural model as well. So when usually the structure is the first thing to be built on the construction site, uh, I can see what's going on uh, on the construction site. I can have the 2D documentation with me, and I can compare it whether uh, the guys are the contractor is doing a good job uh, on the fly or uh, something is not actually right or according to the plans because that needs to be uh, noted. So here I can send messages, attach a screenshot, and if there is a construction mistake, or there is some areas that needs to be uh, recognized or discussed, I can save them and I can send them back to the office. And just to prove you, this is really a multidisciplinary uh, BMX file. I have the MEP systems here as well. And just one more use uh, to the BMX model. Uh, I can color code, with Archicad I can color code uh, elements according to their uh, different characteristics. This is, for example, the fire uh, resistance uh, rating. I think the red element has a higher uh, fire resistance rating than the, the yellow ones. And if I select an element and check the info, I should see the fire resistance rating 90 minutes uh, for the uh, red elements and 60 minutes for the yellow elements. So even when I'm going to the fire department, to do a uh, consultancy with uh, them, or it's a project where I have to do these kind of special consultancies, I can have a model uh, like this with me. We can discuss the details in a 3D environment. Uh, they get a better overview uh, what the building will look like. And if there are mistakes uh, or something is, uh, they want to do uh, some changes, we can make notes here uh, and get back to the office and correct those uh, things. So can we switch back to the PowerPoint, please? So now let's see uh, what are the steps of this uh, open beam project execution. It starts with a discussion. Uh, we should invite all the stakeholders uh, that are present in the project. Uh, of course, the architect, uh, the structure engineer, the MEP engineer. If the contractor is known, uh, we can invite uh, their representative, uh, even the client, and have like a beam kickoff meeting, a beam discussion 
at the very early phase of the project, the very beginning of the project. The earlier, the better, in fact. We can talk about uh, BIM requirements. If the client is familiar with BIM and they have some expectations, uh, what do they want to get out of BIM? We can discuss those uh, expectations and we can uh, transform them into requirements, uh, achievements we have to reach throughout the project, the goals of the, uh, of the BIM uh, project, the BIM workflow. Uh, then we can discuss with the stakeholders uh, the BIM execution, how the architect is going to work together with the structure engineer and the MEP engineer. Uh, what softwares they are using, how they are going to exchange data, what file formats are they using, uh, where to uh, or how to exchange the data. Are we sending email attachments? Are we uploading to a file server or we are using a common data environment? Uh, and the more uh, involved everyone is, uh, the more we need to discuss. We need to discuss file naming conventions, uh, how we code uh, the different files and different file formats. What are the folder structures uh, we, we are using? These are very, very practical things, but we need to think about these uh, and we need to discuss these with the project members for a smooth project execution later on. Uh, we can, if there's like a conceptual design from the architect already, we can discuss the, uh, the model setup or the, the setup of the building, uh, story height, uh, location of the project in the virtual environment. Uh, and these kind of software-related practicalities. And of course, the whole collaboration workflow, uh, how we are bringing these models together, how we are going to uh, check them, and how we are going to handle those uh, issues that we are going to find. And if we are having this meeting, then whatever we discuss, we can uh, put into a document, a document so-called BIM execution plan by BIM standards, or just uh, Casually, we can call it a BIM manual, a project BIM manual, for example. We should uh, write down the, the BIM requirements, the goals of the project, and of course the related deadlines that uh, we have to or we should try keeping. Uh, then, of course, the stakeholders, the, the contact details of the stakeholders. Who are the uh, BIM managers or the, the person responsible for uh, that particular uh, discipline? Who will be the structure engineering contact? Who is the contact from the MEP engineer? Who is the uh, contact point at the architect? These are very practical uh, things again. Uh, but sometimes we don't know, as an architect, we might not know who to call when there is an issue. We just uh, take out the BIM uh, execution plan from the drawer and we, we find for the structure engineer's contact. If we discuss the model setup, these story structures, locations, uh, we can put these into the uh, BIM execution plan as well the data exchange workflow, uh, what are the, uh, how to reach the common data environment, the file server, for example. And of course, the whole schedule of the project with the definite deadlines and with those intermediate deadlines that uh, we are using for uh, collaboration. When are we uploading a new version of the models to the common data environment? When are the uh, checkings happen in Solibri, for example? When are the coordination meetings? Uh, so this schedule, this timeline of the project should be noted as well. Uh, I recommend you look uh, up these BIM execution plans on the internet. There are some free but very good versions that you can uh, uh, you can find. I, I think the on the top right corner, BIM, uh, the project execution planning guide that's from the Penn State University. Uh, it's a template that you can fill in and already start using in your next project. Then, if we did all these preparations, we discussed the aspects of BIM, the, uh, the means of execution, then we can move forward to the actual collaboration. And let's see what are the steps of these collaborations. Uh, it starts, I put zero on the, the model preparation and audit, because every stakeholder who's involved in modeling has to make sure their model is usable for others. We are not modeling only for ourselves, uh, we are in a collaborative environment. We are sharing these models with other stakeholders uh, who need to use those models. So we have to keep, uh, keep in mind uh, what are their needs and requirements in terms of the model. Then, of course, uh, we will export the model from our software solution uh, and upload it to the common data environment or send it as an email attachment or on a pen drive. And we will receive models as well. That's the, the second step when we combine these models. Uh, in one solution. And then the third step is checking. Uh, ch 
checking the architecture against the structural, checking the MEP model against the structural. And of course, we will find mistakes. So no, no project or design is perfect uh, at the first try. So we will find issues, uh, and we need to manage those issues in the end. Now let's, let's start a little bit with this uh, model preparation, because that's uh, a very important step in this whole collaboration and this collaborative environment. First of all, we need to provide accurate geometry. There cannot be like gaps between elements, uh, because then it will not be uh, an actual uh, usable model. We need accurate geometry. We need accurate quantities uh, for further use. And of course, we need certain information uh, to be sent over to the, to the other participant. Uh, if we are uh, lucky or quite advanced, we discussed what kind of information they need uh, during this uh, BIM meeting. And we have this uh, kind of list or template in the BIM execution plan. Uh, so we have like uh, an element ID naming convention. We discussed what kind of classification systems uh, we are using, whether that's uh, uniformat, uniclass, omniclass, uh, or whatever. What kind of properties uh, we are using to exchange data uh, with the other participants. Then, of course, we need to filter our model uh, to send only the relevant part uh, to, the, to the other participant. Let's see an example to, uh, to that. These are different views, 3D views of the same building. On the bottom, we see the whole architectural design, which is good for uh, coordination, for clash detection, for example. Uh, but we only need to give uh, a certain uh, set of this information to the uh, MEP and structure engineer. The structure engineer, for example, only need to know uh, what are those elements that they can use for uh, structural load bearing uh, and maybe the loads in the, in the rooms. They don't need to see the finishes, they don't need to see the, the window, door structures and all the furnitures inside the building. That just makes their model uh, even more heavy. So we need to strip down the architectural model. Uh, similarly, the MEP engineer only need uh, a certain set of uh, information from the architecture model. They need the zones, uh, the rooms, uh, and of course, with their function, what we are doing there. Uh, they need maybe the structural elements so that they can avoid colliding with their uh, pipes. Uh, but they might not need to see the whole facade of the building, and again, they might not need uh, the chairs, the tables, uh, the beds, and other furnishing elements. So this is what we mean by selective uh, data exchange. We filter what we want to send uh, to certain participants. Then we can export our model to IFC file format. Uh, so far, I didn't talk much about IFC, but uh, you all, we can all sense that IFC is behind uh, OpenBeam, right? So why IFC? Let me use the, the analogy of uh, analogy of languages here. Uh, I'm Hungarian, uh, so I speak Hungarian. I'm uh, from Hungary. I speak Hungarian as my mother tongue. Uh, most of you here are uh, Polish. There might be some people from Denmark, Germany, all other countries. So we don't speak the same language. So we need uh, an in-between language. Of course, that's in this uh, case English, uh, with the help of the translators, that enables us to understand each other and to communicate. So English. Uh, is a common language in this case. Similarly, IFC is a common language between the software solutions. Uh, otherwise, they couldn't communicate as well uh, as with, I with the help of IFC. With IFC, we can exchange 3D model data uh, and information attached to elements. But let's not forget uh, our good old 2D file formats, uh, PDF and DWG. Uh, we still might need to use them. Uh, we are living in a, the era of kind of the transition between uh, or from traditional 2D way of working to this new uh, BIM uh, future or BIM vision. We are, I think in 2017, we are in the transition where we have to learn and have to start utilizing the power of IFC, but we also still uh, need PDF and DWG for certain types of uh, traditional workflow. So we need, still need to exchange drawings uh, with each other. So if you remember my uh, circle, the next step is referencing when we are bringing uh, these models from the different stakeholders together. 
this project uh, I'm showing on this image is uh, the Push Cashferen Stadium in Hungary, designed by Kirsty, uh, where I was quite heavily involved as a consultant. Uh, and we brought models together from different sources. The architect uh, worked using uh, Archicad teamwork, and uh, the structure engineers already used different kind of solutions. They used uh, O-Plan for the concrete structures, and they used uh, Tecla structures for the uh, steel structures. The concrete the, the architect could reproduce in Archicad pretty easily, so that was uh, a pure reference model uh, data exchange. They only used the structure concrete model uh, to compare it to the architectural model. Uh, but the roof was different. That's a quite uh, complex uh, precast or uh, prefabricated steel structure that from the Tecla model, they brought it into Archicad and they used it as part of the architectural documentation. They used this roof structure on uh, sections, on elevations, uh, as a core part of the architectural model. So we can not only compare the models together, we can sometimes use each other's model uh, as part of the documentation. Of course, the architect didn't want to change anything in the steel structure because that's not their job. Uh, they only wanted to use this model uh, to show uh, the roof on top of the building. And since uh, we brought the models together, we can start comparing uh, the models from the different stakeholders. And the first step is, uh, I think, is manual comparison or just by looking at the, uh, the models. We can do this in 2D. We can create uh, two sections at the same position, one from the architecture model and one from the uh, structure model. We can overlay these just as we would put two uh, pieces of papers on top of each other. We can do this in the virtual world, thanks to this uh, virtual trace. And we can uh, start comparing the, uh, the most relevant sections, uh, floor plans of the building. And we can use also do this comparison in, in 3D. We can, for example, color code uh, the different models, like white is the architecture model if uh, the structure model is red. Wherever I see red in the uh, 3D window, there might be an error because I don't want to see the structure. I want to cover it with architecture. Uh, so just by looking at the models, uh, with our own eyes, we can spot uh, big mistakes at the beginning of the project. Uh, we don't need, at this stage, uh, too much automa automation. We can spot big mistakes and we can correct them. And of course, when uh, the quality of the design improves, uh, we discuss these mistakes, we might need to uh, introduce some automation. Uh, in the stadium project I mentioned in Hungary, uh, the guy guys are using Solibri to bring all the models together. So they have the architecture model, the structure model from already uh, multiple sources, or plan and tecla uh, structures I mentioned, and the MEP models from even more sources because there are different MEP specialists involved for uh, like heating, for the ventilation, for the electri electricity. So there are models from uh, many, many sources, uh, more than three sources. They bring all these uh, together in Solibri. They can run uh, checking rules, uh, and Solibri will find the mistakes according to those, uh, those rules where, these, uh, where the design differs uh, at one stakeholder from the uh, other discipline. It will pinpoint the problematic points that should be uh, corrected or at least discussed during the design phase before the construction uh, even starts. So the person who's doing this uh, coordination then can collect all these uh, issues, put them in a so-called presentation in Solibri, and then share it with others. There's another file format uh, heavily involved with OpenBIM uh, next to IFC, it's BCF, BIM Collaboration Format. It allows us to uh, attach viewpoints and markup entries, uh, screenshots and comments to, to the issues that we find. And we can uh, share these with others and import these uh, comments to other software so that they see uh, what we saw in, in Solibri. But again, traditional uh, methods uh, exist here as well. We can export these reports in PDF or into uh, Excel like the guys do uh, in this project. And when we have uh, the set of uh, problems, we can go to the uh, next coordination meeting uh, and discuss these issues. And that's how we arrive to the uh, fourth point, uh, the issue management. Uh, in this project, in the stadium project, uh, the stakeholders agreed to, I think, meet uh, once every month because of the size of the project, but it could have been like every two weeks, every one week, depending on your project. 
So all the stakeholders get together uh, once a month, uh, the representative of the architect, structure engineers, the MEP engineers, they go through that list uh, in Excel and they discuss uh, who should correct the issues if it needs to be corrected. Uh, if the contractor is there, they can uh, intervene as well, whether that's something they can, uh, they can solve or work around on the construction site, or whether that's something needs to be redesigned uh, and remodeled uh, or adjusted a little bit. Then if it needs to be redesigned, it's important to decide who, is th uh, who needs to modify their design. Whether the, the architect has to modify some uh, architectural detail, whether a structure engineer needs to uh, cut a hole through a beam, for example, or, or change something in the structural model, uh, or whether there's the MEP engineer who needs to reroute their pipes so that they could not collide with the structure ele elements. So on these coordination meetings, it's very, very important to, to have these decisions uh, and to sort the issues according to the uh, responsible uh, discipline, basically, who's going to correct uh, that issue. And then everyone goes home, uh, starts to adjust the design, make these uh, changes, uh, and then uh, when the next month uh, elapses, then they meet again for the next coordination meeting, and hopefully there will be less issues. So as you can see, uh, this coordination is a cyclical uh, event. It doesn't only happen once, it should happen multiple times in the project, following these same steps, uh, exporting the model, referencing, checking, uh, and issue management. And hopefully the result of this coordination is that the number of errors uh, decreases with time in the model, uh, in the design. And that means the quality of the design increases, uh, so it will be uh, a better building design in the end, with fewer issues, uh, for the construction, for the contractor to solve. And basically this is how OpenBIM enables uh, to achieve these goals uh, that were phrased so nicely by the, the guys in the UK. Uh, following these uh, coordination rules and principles, uh, in the end the building will be cheaper, it, will be, it can be built quicker, if we are doing analysis it will be greener, and I can promise you, uh, you will learn a lot during this uh, projects that you be, you can utilize in your next projects. So if there is only one slide that you remember from my presentation, I think it should be it because OpenBIM makes this uh, whole thing possible uh, and enables us to achieve these goals that our clients uh, put in front of us. And just as a last thought, let's have a look out uh, to the BIM standards because I think that's another proof uh, why OpenBIM is important. We collected how many uh, BIM standards, guidelines there are in the world, uh, and so far actually it's uh, surprisingly many. Uh, and the majority of these is based on OpenBIM uh, standards, IFC and the related standards. Uh, you saw uh, from Stefan that UK is pretty ahead uh, with their BIM standards. They actually mandated it last year and they are already working on the, the next level, the level three. Uh, in Europe, uh, Austria is uh, working fast on their uh, own BIM standard, and of course there are some BIM standards and guidelines in the Nordic region, uh, and in other parts of the world uh, as well. And these standards have a lot of similar characteristics. There are uh, similar uh, topics or, or phrases that pop up in, in most of these standards. For example, the BIM execution plan, that we have to have a document uh, lay down the foundation of the project uh, and understood and accepted by all the stakeholders in the project. That's the BIM execution plan. Most of these standards mention some kind of level of development or detail or information, whatever we call it, that's basically uh, the, the level of geometry or how detailed our model is and how much information uh, we incorporate in that model. They can also mention BIM protocols uh, and data organization like this uh, common data environment uh, terminology or, or principle that we are sharing uh, or the stakeholders are sharing the information in one environment and everyone can access that info, uh, information and be up to date. 
and sometimes there are some modeling guidelines uh, so that the models are wouldn't say similar to each other but based uh, but are built in a similar mindset so uh, later on they can be used for quantity takeoff purposes for example and these national BIM standards are usually not just one document you saw that uh, they are a set of related standards and it's also important to talk about BIM standards because we are part of the European Union and uh, you might not know that the EU is actually working on its BIM standard so the EU BIM standardization is happening in the SAN TC442 uh, group, which is basically uh, the SAN is dealing with standards uh, in the EU, and this technical committee 442 is assigned to the topic of BIM. It consists of four work groups dealing with different as aspects of uh, BIM project execution, strategy and planning, uh, information exchange data, that's basically the PI format, IFC PI format, uh, information delivery specification, uh, there's the more about the process and the whole workflow, uh, and data dictionaries uh, to describe uh, product-related data. So they are trying to cover all aspects of, uh, of the building design and, uh, and construction and operation. Uh, VS Graphisoft also joined uh, this movement uh, as a delegate through the Hungarian Standardization in Institute, uh, me personally, I'm a delegate in the work group two, dealing with uh, IFC mostly. Uh, in last year, October, they already accepted three uh, international standards uh, as part of these European standards. Uh, and the, the most important one for us, I think, is IFC. Uh, that's again why reason it's important to learn about IFC, because sooner or later it will become the European standard uh, here in our country as well. And the latest news is that uh, September, uh, two months ago, uh, this uh, technical committee of the EU visited Hungary and had the latest work group meeting uh, in the Grafisov Park, uh, very close to us. So the EU BIM standard is coming. There's still a couple of years uh, ahead until it will be published, I think. Uh, but it's good to good to know about it at least, uh, and it's good to know uh, and acknowledge that it will be based on uh, open BIM uh, principles. So thank you very much for being here today and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>